We are live, baby. All right, guys, uh, today is Tech Tuesday. We are going to be doing a uh, race recap, and then we are going to be talking about the strength of uh, different metal and how to test it and how we test it here to make sure that things are structurally sound. But in order to do all that, we got to go over to Justin Smith. Oh, damn it. I was trying to walk around the back of him, <laughs> and so he couldn't, he couldn't get me, but uh, I was way too slow. Josh, cat-like reflexes are pretty damn good, sir. Um, hi, guys. Thanks for signing in to our feed. And yes, Steve is right. Um, we're going to give you a small race report from the Laughlin race this last weekend, um, which was hot uh, outside and hot inside the car. But uh, as well as kind of go over what ended our race and some of the metallurgy and science behind wheel studs, uh, lug nut studs, hub studs. Speaking of studs, Steve. Stop it. I was going to say it probably gets a lot hotter in the car once you jump in. Uh -huh. I see what you did there. That's pretty cute. I like that. Angling for a raise. That's what that is right there. Um, Mitch, don't suck up. It's not, not a good look. Nope. No, sir. no. But um, I'll just head right, I'll get right into the race report. Uh, Laughlin, uh, what do they call it? Champions? Race of Champions? Legends. 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 Um, best in the desert. Put on a great event. Um, very hard to do because it was 100 and a lot uh, this weekend. Um, it was 108, 9, 10, something like that. Humidity, no wind, really bad. Um, cars running hot. Belts always going to be running hot. Uh, tempers going to be running hot. And um, we did our best to kind of throw ice on ourselves for qualifying and for the race and do what we could. We, we had a pretty good car, really no temp issues. So that didn't hold us up. But from our perspective, what happened in the race, we started in the second row, qualified 11th, and it's a land rush start with eight cars at once, angling for the first turn. Um, we didn't get a very good start. We lost two spots, ended up settling in behind Brandon Sims, who, by the way, started behind us because we qualified ahead of Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he got us in the first corner, so there's uh, something to be said for that. And then we kind of sat behind Brandon with a super amount of dust and drove off of his blue light uh, somewhere between 30 and 80 miles an hour blind, which is always fun, not. But about six or seven turns into it, uh, we had a, a chance. Um, and Brandon is saying that he has uh, to, he might have GoPros of the front of his car so that we have footage of us passing him. Ooh. <laughs> Well, Brandon, if you're, out, if you're out there, sign in right now, buddy. We'll get you in. But um, we took a chance around a corner and uh, got, got around Brandon. But it was short-lived because we were sitting in there in the car yelling and screaming about how we passed Brandon and how we were happy about that, that I missed a 90 left in the dust coming up. And in this section of the course, it's a lot of bermed, you know, graded three-foot-tall outside berms. And, you know, you rail this stuff as fast as you can. Well, when we passed Brandon, we blew the next turn and went straight off that berm and shot into the desert. It was one of those carnival touching every single corner of the car until it finally settled down and we get going. Is that Brandon? Yeah, Brandon. All right, bring him in here, man. I wanted to ask him a couple of questions. Um, Brandon, you there? He's in. All right. So. All right, so uh, we got settled in, uh, hopped back on the course behind Brandon, and uh, the whole first lap was super dusty. So we had a slow pace the first lap, uh, ended up getting around a couple of guys on the second lap and stuck behind some more dust again, second and third lap. But on our fourth lap, we had some clean air, and we were able to run a lap time that was more um, akin to what we could possibly do. It was uh, like a 17, 50, or 18 second lap. And uh, we, are in our, uh, we gained about 45 seconds on the leader. We were only about 25 seconds behind them at the time, according to tracking. And on our fifth lap, we turned the pace up even more, so we were expecting good things. But on the fifth lap, all of a sudden, in a straightaway, the car got squirrely. We had no idea what was going on until all of a sudden a tire ends up hitting the window net on the passenger side. And we knew that we had lost something uh, pretty major on the right rear corner came to a stop um, on the skid plate because we have no tire on the car. And my brother hops out and is looking for the tire that rolled off into the middle of the desert. And I'm calling in what happened. And all of a sudden, we get a fire inside the car. 
and out of the car, I'm jumping out, grabbing a fire extinguisher, trying to put it out, and the fire is getting bigger than my extinguisher can put out, and I'm worried I'm running out of extinguisher, and it's not gonna help. And my brother shows up with a second extinguisher and goes for it with that, and it just ends up crushing the handle and the extinguisher didn't work. So he throws that out of the way and grabs the third fire extinguisher right when I'm running out of fire extinguisher. And uh, the third one barely worked and that still wasn't enough to put it out. And just as I'm running out of fire extinguisher on mine, then Dominic, our pilot, comes in and taps me on the shoulder because he landed the helicopter emergency right away knowing the car was on fire and shows up with the helicopter extinguisher and we used that and that was just enough to put the fire out. The fire was a bush that we had stopped on when we came to a stop and uh, it wasn't actually the car. Very little damage but it ended our race and what the cause was is uh, shearing lug nut studs off of the hub and we will get into those details. Brandon, how's it going man? Brandon, you got me? I think so. Do I got you? I hear you, buddy. I heard you're a little under the weather. You all right? Ah, uh, man. I got the old COVID thing, and it is, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not fun, I'll tell you that. Um, uh, you know what, though? You probably wouldn't have it if you weren't kissing Skylar, and Skylar wasn't kissing Jacob. Yeah, there was an unfortunate, uh, Three -way. Uh, unfortunate uh, uh, turn of events there. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you guys are just a little too close. You can admit it. Yeah, yeah. We actually had too much fun a week ago, and I think we're paying for it now. <laughs> so. Well, at least you weren't too bad for the race, right? You were able to run it? Yeah, I just tried to stay away from everybody, wear a mask, uh, and uh, was able to actually do the race. I feel like I'm paying for it a little bit more now than I was uh, over the weekend, but um, now I'm at home just trying to get better. Well, you qualified 12th, and we started next to each other on the land rush start. Tell everybody how your race went for the first few laps. You know, I feel like I'm kind of bringing a, a knife to a gunfight with the, the car that I have. It's a little bit bigger of a car. Um, Laughlin's a little bit of a short style race, short course style race. In my opinion, it's kind of like a works race. I used to do some works racing and it's kind of similar to that. Now, my car's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more designed for uh, the bigger, longer races. Um, works really well on those. I feel like the only place I had any kind of advantage at this course was uh, possibly the, the Fox Proving Grounds, where uh, uh, the suspension on my car worked really well through there, actually. Now, um, qualifying, I mean, it was only like a 2.5 or just under maybe three-mile qualifying loop or, or whatever it may be. And uh, I just I just can't uh, – my car's just tough to get, get faster, these, these, those qualifying sections. So – I think we qualified like 12th right behind you. I think, what, a half a second or something like that? Yeah, but, oh, that half a second. How sweet it is. <laughs> the half a second is pretty imperative nowadays, you know? It d doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile, right? <laughs> I'm going to run with that for a long time at the bar, Brandon. Trust me. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we qualified like 12th. Um, started, obviously, second row next to you. And uh, I, I, evidently, we got a little bit better start than you uh, and uh, got to that first corner. I, I just know that Skyler was yelling at me that you were right there on my right-hand side. And I want to say that we were even uh, touching tires, which is not something I wanted to do because I was watching the Pro and Limited uh, race right before that. And uh, there was actually that big accident, and that happened right in front of us. I was watching it. Uh, um, unfortunate uh, events right there. I, know, I never want to see any kind of uh, accidents like that. So that's the last thing I wanted to happen with us. So, you know, I was, I was about to... Uh, hit the brakes and let you go, but then I was like, no, I've got a dollar on the line, so I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> That's right. We'll get back to that signed dollar later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So oh, I mean, Steve, once we finally got... tucked into position there. Um, what what got, Steve? Steve? I got a question from, I heard you got a new wrap on your car. Oh, man, I got new wraps all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think I've got so many more sponsors. We may have to... Uh, uh, up our, uh, uh, we're gonna have to go through our contract again and check out some stuff. <laughs> Re Renegotiation. <laughs> yeah, we we definitely need to renegotiate because I mean there are stickers everywhere, and they're not they're not <laughs> shitty stickers. They are high quality stickers, and they well, uh, they stick uh, well. Yeah, um, you know, uh, just because most people don't know what we're talking about, maybe you should fill them in. Yeah, so I think every time uh, I I 
we uh, we parked my truck and trailer and everything in a, a similar parking area as uh, the shock therapy team. And it seemed like every time I came out to my truck to get in it, there was a new uh, a new sticker somewhere on the truck, car, um, wherever it may be. I think I've got uh, shock therapy sponsored wheels, uh, shock <laughs> therapy sponsored fender walls on the truck, um, shock, shock therapy sponsored uh, Baja designed lights. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, there wasn't a spot that was missed. So, yes, we, uh, we have quite a bit of new stickers on the cars and trucks and trailers. Hey, Brandon, um, I, got, I got just a word of advice. Um, you have no idea how many stickers are on that car until you actually prep it. There's, yeah, it's going to be quite interesting. <laughs> I, keep, I haven't had a chance to even go out there. I've been, I've been under the weather, and I, I, this is the last thing I want to go look at. But I'm sure they're going to be everywhere. It should be interesting to see uh, where they're at. Uh, I'm sure I have shock therapy sponsored engine and a few other things if I had to guess. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. Well, so yes, I do have that everywhere. Um, but yes, back to the racing action. As soon as we tucked into position, um, I mean, it was dusty. I couldn't see anything. Uh, I was trying to play it a little bit safer than you, evidently. I think you were trying to win the race in the first uh, maybe three miles. I'm not quite sure. Nope, um, nope, nope. I was just trying to pass you. That was it. <laughs> well, well, I think we got like uh, eight, maybe five turns into the desert section after leaving the short course section, and you blew my doors off. And I was like, whoa, that was, that was impressive because I couldn't see, which means you couldn't see because you were dealing not only with the dust from me, but the dust in front of me as well. So I think you made it about 100 yards, and you blew the corner right in front of me, which was fantastic to watch. And uh, I actually went to tuck in and uh, try to get that spot back, but you actually somehow got the car under composure, got it back on course in front of me, and uh, had me for the next corner, in which you blew again, I think. Um, yep. straight, straight, straight off that, and then that just left the door wide open for me. So I, I tucked in there and... Uh, made sure to get in front of you, wiggle the steering wheel a bunch so that I made it extremely dusty. And uh, <laughs> that way you had no chance at making any time on me then. Um, and then for the next I think, lap, I just followed a, a, a lot of dust. Uh, I was trying to play it safe. Uh, um, I knew I had enough distance where you weren't through the dust barrier and you were going to have to risk it a lot to get back in front of me. So um, we ran it really hard, as, as hard as I could, that big car, until I – I finally had a, a, a part in the front end, a steering knuckle that failed on me trying to push it really hard through one of the berms. So um, it's a part that I'm going to address in between now and the, the next race. So uh, um, that won't happen again for us. Uh, so, I mean, we had a fun lap and a half or two laps, something like that, uh, battling with you. And it's always fun, you know, uh, jockeying for position like that. But uh, um, I see that you had a, a good race going until you didn't. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much normal excuse. But back to uh, back to that amazing pass. Um, so <laughs> um, I was I asked Skyler uh, uh, what you guys thought about the bottom of my car because clearly you had a really good look of it when I went flying and missed the complete the whole corner and shot off that berm. By the way, um, best 300 yards of my racing career. I can only imagine. <laughs> Um, no, it was a ton of fun. Actually, in all seriousness, Brandon, uh, you're great to race with, especially at the beginning of the race. Gave us plenty of room. We tried to do exactly the same thing, and we wouldn't have been able to go through that dust in the first five corners uh, if we weren't following your blue, blue light. So uh, it was a ton of fun. It was. Yeah, you know, that makes it fun. I wish we could have saw a little bit more. The, the weird part was I thought it was pretty windy, but it didn't seem like the wind was helping us at all at that point. Yeah, at the beginning, it looked like 30 mile an hour, and I was really happy, but it went away at the start of the race. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think when it was blowing, it was blowing either with us or against us. So all we were doing was uh, consuming the, uh, the, the dust there each direction. It never seemed like it was a crosswind for us. Brandon, what's the next race for you? You know, I think I'm going to gear up and do the UTV World Championships, and then right after that, we're going to go do the Baja 1000. So we've got a couple big races coming right up. Uh, championships, didn't you, uh, weren't you second or third last time? Yeah, we actually got third last year at YouTube World Championships. I think we missed, uh, I, it was within minutes for the top three. So, I mean, it was a tight race. Um, I think the Martelli guys have uh, pulled out a little bit more strings this year for us, and we're going to have a, a little bit bigger race course. Um, 
So uh, looking forward to that, and uh, we'll go run it hard there, address the issue that we had at this race, and, and, uh, and see if we can't go run really hard at the next one. Well, good luck at the next race, Brandon. Uh, as, as I said, great racing with you, as always. Uh, tell Skyler hi, and uh, uh, hopefully you're on the podium again for the next race. That's the plan. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for everything, right, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. All right, see ya. It's always fun talking with Brandon because his side of his side of the, the story, um, it, well, it matches mine. Just mine's way better. I say yours is better. <laughs> his is just too technical and strategic, and yours is just like, dude, I passed your ass. And <laughs> <laughs> we honestly we blew the first corner as soon as we passed Brandon because we were both overly celebrating that we passed him. That was mainly the reason. But the one we jumped off of and landed in the middle of the desert was all my fault. <laughs> My brother was calling it out perfect in the dust, and I, I missed it 100%. But back to uh, our uh, racing. So our race was shortened by shearing off some lug studs. And so we're going to show you a little bit about lug nuts. Not, I'm sorry, not lug nuts, but studs, um, wheel hub studs, lug studs, These dry nuts. flange stud, whatever you want to call it. Um, it is a stud that holds the wheel via a lug nut, right? Also, I'm going to tell you in advance, all of you metallurgy engineers, I don't want to hear anything about me giving the wrong information here. I'm somewhat of an engineer, but not on metallurgy. So I'm going to give you the overview on some of this stuff, not the details. You guys can fight it out amongst yourselves with your pocket protectors and thick glasses so politely <laughs> f you all right <laughs> i don't want to hear it this is uh this is the easy side of things so over here um we've got some of the studs that uh came out of the race car so this is a dry flange that's on the car this is one of the studs that was left in it obviously these normally are pressed in the back and uh normally they are about that long so we sheared the studs off and uh, we actually sheared all four studs. We sheared three studs at one time, and then the remaining stud was left on there for about 100 yards until it, it actually ripped and snapped the section of the wheel that was holding that on there. Um, normally, you use, lose studs or have problems with studs because the lug nut comes loose. And when that comes loose, uh, let me get back to my little demonstration. When that comes loose, then it wobbles around on the wheel and shows where inside the wheel. Here's the wheel that was on the car. And you can see that other than the piece that broke off the last stud to hold, all of these locations have no wear whatsoever. That these were actually tight and they did not come loose before breaking the stud. So we lost the studs first. Last one sheared off, tire ends up exiting the car. So why do you lose studs? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. You can have um, inferior quality, say like, I don't know, uh, stock or less would be something that a lot of the race guys get rid of. Um, you can have a wheel stud or lug stud that's been on there for a very, very long time. These are wearable parts in a lot of ways. If it's your road car, everyday driver, not that big a deal. But, you know, in off-road, you're going to see a lot more stress. Also, you're going to have the wheels and tires off that car so many times. Every single time that you torque a lug nut onto that stud, you're stretching the stud. And certain materials will accept that stretch more times than others. So for instance, um, a weaker material may only allow you to put the lug nut on there 100 times before it snaps. A better material might allow you to do that 2,000 times before it snaps. So material selection is very important. Here, we have a few different studs. One, uh, I believe stock. stock is there. Which one? That one? This one I got here, stock. So here's a stock stud. Um, don't judge any of these studs by the color. That's merely just plating. But this is a stock stud. Um, we don't actually know the exact material because again, we're not, we're not in the business of testing materials here. But it's pretty common knowledge that most of the race teams um, replace the stock studs every three or four races or at least if they don't race very much, at least once a year. <clears throat> if you don't, then you're probably gonna have a failure in one of these, especially with a heavy wheel tire and you're gonna run it hard. Stock stud. Next, we've got a stainless steel stud. So pretty in color, and the reason it doesn't look like polished stainless steel is because this has actually been heat treated. 
So polished stainless looking material, then heat treat gets you kind of this gold look, stainless steel. Then you've got high carbon steel. High carbon studs can be multiple material uh, grades. Just go up, the actual combination or mixture of metals is changing. Some have more silicone, some have more carbon, um, other materials are mixed in there and that's where I'm gonna bow out and let you engineers fight it out. But between 4130 and the, one of the highest grades, which is basically around what people know as 300M, which is an axle material, um, is 8740. 8740 is a very high grade carbon steel. Um, it's easy to heat treat to whatever you want um, from a Rockwell standpoint, but it can maintain flexibility if the heat treat is done properly and the manufacture of the stud is done properly. When I say heat treat, let's talk about Rockwell numbers. Well, a lot of uh, low carbon steels come in the 15 to 30 Rockwell range. Well, higher the number, the harder it is. But the harder you get, as you get into the 40 Rockwells, 50s, 52s, 56s, that hardness becomes brittle. So not only is it strong because it's hard, but you could get it too hard and all of a sudden it's easy to snap. <laughs> now, Steve, does that hurt you thinking about snapping a stud? I love when a stud is extra hard and it snaps. <clears throat> well, I, I, I go with the heart first half of that, but not the second <laughs> half of that. It's a trip to the hospital, I think, on the second half, Steve. Yes. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but imagine this. If you've got mild steel or, say, fence post uh, galvanized, really weak material, you can bend that almost by hand if it's small. And you get into the high carbon stuff, um, you're gonna have to bend it over your knee or in a press. And once you uh, harden it to 40s and 50s, it's so hard there's no way that you can actually bend that, even in a press, until you bend it too far and it snaps. And if you get something too hard, you get into like drill bit hardness ratings. And you know what happens to a drill bit if you take it with pliers and squeeze it, or take it with a hammer and smack it, it just it completely shatters not quite like glass, but that would be the point at which things are too hard to function for off-road. Back to materials. We've actually uh, taken all these studs and we've thrown them in a Rockwell tester. And a Rockwell tester is a device that allows you to check what the hardness is of the material or basically telling you the Rockwell rating. Again, Rockwell ratings, 15 to 50 in that range and different materials are going to be different hardnesses. But the goal is, when it comes to wheel studs, to use a material that can be hardened to the point where it's hard enough and very, very strong for your application, but maintain just a little bit of flex so that, especially in a wheel application, it can stretch and come back and not fail. Now, that cycling of the material, stretching and coming back to its normal position, or bending and coming back to its normal position, very, very important in a wheel stud for a couple reasons. One, every time you torque that lug nut onto the wheel stud, you're physically stretching the stud. So imagine this, and you're tightening down this lug nut on the wheel, torque it to 100 foot-pounds, you're actually stretching this material. And if you use a material that doesn't like to be stretched, eventually it's going to snap. If you use one that's designed to stretch just a little bit, it might live a long time. Then you have the stress of horsepower. So this stud is moving around in a circle, engine is driving the wheel, it's in the air, na, 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 uh, and it grabs the ground or the next whoop. That's a stress on sideways bending forces on these studs. Then you have the flex of the wheel or expansion rate of the wheel. So you have a steel drive flange, you have steel lug nuts, steel studs, and you have an aluminum wheel. That aluminum wheel is gonna want to expand and contract more with the same temperature in this area as you're driving that. That means it puts more stress on the stud to extend it and stretches it even further. If you're already at the torque yield rate that it's designed for, then that extra temp can actually run that torque rating higher, stressing the stud, or even if this is a bolt, same thing. Imagine studs are bolts. Um, so all of those stresses can be contributors to what we had a problem with, Mitch. So that was actually a question was, can they break from over torque? Absolutely. So over torquing a stud or over torquing a bolt does the same thing as stretching it. You're, you're, you're stretching the hardware to gain the torque rating and yield you want. 
If you over torque it, you're over stretching it and it could be stretching it past the material's ability to hold it and then you have breakage. Just depends on the material you're using. Mitch. Um, Parker Sports Center, what about rim hole size as some holes are 12 millimeter and studs are 10 millimeter relying on the nut taper to hold it all tight? So um, if you have a loose fit between the wheel and the stud, there's multiple theories on this. If the torque rating is correct, then you shouldn't, and you have a wheel that's designed correct, that slot between the stud and the, and the center of the wheel hole should not be a factor because the lug nut self-centers that. And that torque yield has the crush pressure on the wheel to allow it not to move. If the wheel moves back and forth on the stud, hitting it inside the hole, then you have other problems. Uh, not enough torque to begin with, faulty wheel design, other issues. But in general, the larger the stud, the stronger the system, no matter what. You start talking about like trophy trucks, you know, they're not going to start off running um, the original studs that came on a three quarter ton Chevy truck, you know, or maybe even a half ton Chevy truck might be half inch stud. You know, they're stepping that stuff up to five eighths or three quarter, and they're also stepping it up to 300M material or 87. 100, like uh, we had talked about, 8740. So, Steve. You always got to have that one guy. He said, I can't help but ask, but if there were concentric rings to keep the pressure off the studs, like the Speed UTV, would that still happen? I don't even, what, what is a concentric? Is that just so it's, a single? It's a, it's, what, what it's doing is it's trying, a concentric ring tries to maintain the same torque with temp. So uh, as, it, as it can expand and contract, and, the, and essentially the torque would be the same mm. on it. Um, so yeah, that would help. Um, but it's not going to help the reason why we broke studs, and I'll get into that. So anything else? OK. So back to material. Um, wheel studs need to flex. You don't want to pick a material that doesn't. And we did some testing on what we have. So in the hub that we have is a stainless steel stud. Stainless steel comes in multiple grades. There's lots of them, and I'm not going to go through the list. It's quite long. But there's only two grades that you really want to use when it comes to hardening or heat treating stainless steel. Um, the issue with stainless isn't that you can't get it hard. You can heat treat stainless quite hard. As a matter of fact, we tested this one, and it's a 43 Walkwell um, with a stud that we actually, one of the studs that we broke is a 51. And uh, which is pretty hard. So you can get stainless steel that's fairly hard. That's not the issue. The issue is that stainless likes to case harden. So what is case harden? Well, when you flex a bolt, or really anything that you can possibly break, where that flex point is right in the middle, as that moves back and forth, the material can change. It depends on the material you start with, but stainless has the characteristic of case hardening that flex flexible spot. So wherever you flex it back and forth, the material gets harder as it flexes. That's a problem because then it becomes too hard and it becomes brittle. And then Steve, what will happen if it is too hard and it is brittle? It will fall off. That is right. And or Steve, in our case, shear off. Shear off. <laughs> and uh, in, in Steve's personal you know, uh, experience, he ends up in the hospital and they're trying to fix it. Or the, yeah, the more you move it, the harder it gets, and then it just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We won't go there, though. Uh, well, actually, that's very, very true. The more you move it, <laughs> the, more the harder move it, the it gets, harder, yes. Steve. You nailed it. <laughs> um, so that case hardening in stainless steel characteristics is a problem when you have flexing. When you go into different grades of carbon steels, 43, 40, um, and into the really high quality stuff in the 8700 series, you can actually harden it to a lower Rockwell, say in the 40s instead of in the 50s, keep it not as brittle and allow it to flex, especially in a place like a hub where it needs to flex and a place where you're throwing studs on it or lug nuts on it regularly, torquing it and stretching it regularly so it's a much better material to use. So we're going to show you an example of this case hardening. So Tony, Professor Tony is going to help us out here real quick. What we're going to do, though, before Tony you do this is, Josh, come on in here. You guys, we have tested this sheared off stud that was in our race car. You can see some of the scratch points and indentations up here. We've tested this one in advance, and we know what this one is. But we have another one all the way up in here. And Josh, if you can show everybody, that's a diamond tipped a uh, piece inside this Rockwell tester. And what it is doing right now, it's applying pressure to the material. 
and it's telling us what the hardness rating is of that stud. Well, what we're testing right now is the surface that sheared off. Take a look at this gauge. That's a 72 Rockwell. 72. You know what this actual stud was on the outside of it, everywhere else on the stud? It was a 48. So this thing is hardened to a 48 Rockwell, but as soon as this flexed back and forth and sheared off, this surface right here is a 72. That is case hardening. That's what happens when stainless steel flexes, becomes brittle, and shears off. So just to show you the rest of this, so Tony, why don't you go ahead and pull that out. And Josh, if you can watch Tony do his thing. We're going to change the location that we're actually testing on that stud. Instead of testing the sheared surface, we're going to test the normal part of that stud. And watch Tony just kind of lay it up in there, get it started. The process here is that you get it inside the machine and then you do a preload on the machine, set your zero point, which is the B, we're looking at the, I'm sorry, the C, we're looking at the black numbers here, set the weight load on the machine, and now it's going to apply force to your part and give you a Rockwell number. And we have 54. So the outside of this stud is a 54 Rockwell. The inside where it sheared is a 75. Let's go back to how, how what hard is. <laughs> Typically 48, Steve. Yeah, sorry. There's, just, there's good comments on here. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's joking because he thinks I. Anyway. Um, 48 to 52 typically is your hard materials that tend to not shear. Um, in the 50s is pretty hard. Anywhere up in that 70 range, you're looking at drill bit strength, and that's easy to shear and snap. So we can see what happened to the stud after the fact, knowing what it was and what it is after it's flexed. So what we're going to do to fix our problem is we're getting the right stud into this stuff. We're going straight to RPI. RPI. Um, is a custom bolt manufacturer that loves the racing industry because they're racers just like us. They race Mexico in class one and class 10. They also build very, very high quality for the military and for off-road racing. RPI does a lot of 12-point hardware and other hardware kits for UTVs coming soon. Clutch main um, uh, front primary bolts for clutches. Major components that right now you guys can probably have damage in your normal UTV that's not a race car, or if you're a racer, these are things that you need anyway. So RPI is supplying us with 8740 studs for the car. Give you a little bit more information on an 8740 from them. It is hardened to a 43 Rockwell. A 43, why not 53? Well, 43 is gonna give you a little bit more flex because the high quality material already has the strength. They also bring that material up to a point where it has 180, I'm looking at notes because I had too many numbers here, 180 PSI. That means that that stud has a shear strength of 180,000 pounds. So much, much higher than a standard stud or a stainless stud. And the longevity is massive because it's designed to flex from the material starting point. Other ways you can build studs, a lot of people will machine the stud at a solid bar and actually cut the threads into the stud, it's not the best way to do it. If you take a look at some YouTube videos, watch threads rolled or rolling threads or thread processes when things are rolled to create threads. That's actually the right way to do it. What's happening when you roll threads into a bolt is you're squeezing the material together, which is basically forging the material into a stronger unit and forging the threads into it instead of cutting through the material and then hardening later. So threading um, through a roll mechanism is much better. The plating process is much better. Um, definitely contact RPI for all your stud and hardware needs. Mitch. I got three things. Three. So first, hi from Factory UTV. They're hey, watching. what's up? Um, what about titanium wheel studs? And yeah. then Steve, did you guys test Steve's Smeckle, Smeckle stones? 
Ooh, <laughs> oh, we should rock I've got, your I've got a bunch of them, so we could test them. <laughs> oh, we should do that. I've got quite a but few. You know what, though? Are, are they calcium? That means they're going to shatter. They're huh? uric. They're what? Uric acid. Yeah. Uric acid? Yeah. So, like I said, I'm not a chemist. I'm, I'm, not, out of it. I'm not either. I'll let you touch them. Yeah, it's cool. Um, We'll do that. That's a good one on episode. We'll try that. Uh, the other one was titanium studs. Um, again, I'm not a metallurgist, so I can't answer that. But knowing a little bit about titanium numbers, you're not going to get the tensile strength out of tie as you are out of some of the high carbon steels. So I would expect that they would have a lower yield. Um, that's going to have a high flex point depending on the titanium that you use. So you're probably not going to have a problem flexing it back and forth and breaking it. But I have a feeling you're probably not going to have the tensile that these do. And I would probably stay away from that. So the people want to know, when are we going to make shock therapy studs? <laughs> oh, we make shock therapy studs daily. You're looking at one right there. Dude, right here. There he is. Right here. Stud number one. The original prototype. <laughs> <laughs> Tube sock stud Steve. Oh, damn. Yeah, we might have to go with the new. It's just it, getting, it's worse. It's getting yeah. worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to put the stud thing to bed, um, I don't think we're going to have any problems in the future when we st upgrade this stuff. Uh, it was our fault for not checking it in advance. Had a short race, had a good run. Um, when we broke the car, we were somewhere between third and fifth and, and moving up. So it's unfortunate that it was shortened our race. Apologize for letting you guys down if you're following us. But the car is pretty much going to be prepped here in a few days. We'll be testing it again and get ready for the championships in Havasu next month. I think it's somewhere around the 16th or 17th of October. So that's our next race. If you guys have any questions about wheel studs for your UTV, contact RPI, and that is in California. Um, I thought I had their address in my, my head, but I don't think so. They're like Lancaster, high desert, uh, Southern California, high desert. But excellent material, excellent hardware. Um, ton of the race teams, big trophy truck teams all use RPI material. So, material and hardware. Just a bolts, studs. So many words for all the things that they make. Too many things for me to say. Steve, rapid fire of any kind, have you got anything? Uh, just one of the guys, Sean Williams, wants to say, I think the raffle you guys are doing is awesome. Thanks for being a great company and helping oh, others. Dude, Steve, talk about fingers that. Crossed. So, guys, the raffle is over. Uh, we have filled it up. Well, it's not over, it's just full. Well, it's full. Sorry, it's not over, it's full. Uh, we are going to announce it in, I don't know, but it took four days, guys, so it was awesome with the support you guys gave. Uh, we're going to be able to give back. But uh, You know what? Explain that again. We had some people lose everything they own. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. so we had, we had one of our own lose uh, their house, their cars, everything they had. Uh, so we want to kind of help them get back on their feet, which is where you guys came in and helped out tremendously. Um, so we filled all the spots. We got to talk a little bit. I think we're going to announce it before the 30th. I don't have an exact date on the announcement, but you guys will be the first ones to know as soon as we do. Thank you very much for joining in on that, everyone yeah. who did. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate that. Mitch, you got any rapid fire, bro? Um, guy got IQS and valving springs on our X3, loves it. He wanted to know if there's anything he needs to do when washing the rig. Are the adjuster towers all waterproof? Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, there's no real special precautions you should take to wash it. Just wash it normal. Yeah. It's actually uh, got seals, if I believe, or like a, a weather tech kind of plug into it, that it, that'll protect it from getting water inside there. Uh, so weather you should pack. be good. Weather, weather pack, that's yeah. what I was trying to say. Weather tech floor mat. Yeah. Yep. Which are yep. waterproof too. <laughs> Got the, <yeah. laughs> Not wrong. Um, uh, Justin, I got one. Would you yeah. recommend ZRP studs and their lug nuts? So, um, it, uh, I don't know if ZRP is making both stainless and high carbon studs. Uh, if they're carbon studs, I would recommend them. If they're stainless, then I would not. Um, by the way, ZRP makes some really high quality stuff. We run ZRP everywhere on our car, all the hubs, all the drive flanges, pretty much everything that ZRP makes, we've got on our car. Love their products. Uh, absolutely recommend them for everyone. Stud? I've got, More no, stud jokes? I figured you were going to have no, a bunch sorry, of stud jokes. Sorry, I'm, I, I had mm. them, but they're, they're gone. Mm. Um, uh, do we warranty out radius rods? Uh, I don't think we have any warranty on radius rods. No, it, um, I think our, all of our radius rod warranties are against manufacturer's defects. Um, basically, we make them correct, and we guarantee that. Um, the only way you can damage a radius rod is if you run it into a boulder or wreck the car. <laughs> so, yeah, so no. And we don't cover wrecks, so no, if it's bent up, nope, nope. And also, rod ends are a wearable part, so it's not like we can warranty rod ends after a couple of years. 
um, they are designed to be replaced, like brake pads. Jay Hub said he rode Sunday after installation on Tuesday. Rides incredible. Awesome, Jay. Oh yeah. He Hello gave me from some Brazil. From, uh, Give me some uh, Brazil. We got a Brazil. Nice. Yeah. I can't wait. Some beer from Michigan. Just in time for me to quit drinking, though. Oh, I got one month. I'm not sure if I can pull it off. I got no you always, drinking. You always force me to do it, so I'm <laughs> okay. I'm gonna 30 days. It, I'm gonna stick it back to you. To 30 try and days. Get you drinking. That, 30 that's days. where we're at. All right. So last question. Yeah, this last is a good question. one. Um, hello from Brazil. Can I use your radius rods with the ZRP hubs? Great video. Absolutely. We do have a special spacer on the outside of our radius rod joint for a ZRP hub. Make sure that you order the right ZRP, uh, the right radius rod kit for a ZRP uh, hub, which is an option on the website for you to choose. If you have any questions, call us. Good? Uh, I got one more. Yep. I have a 2019 Turbo S blown rear shock tube. What are my options from you all? So he's got 2019, so he's got the old style body. I would recommend upgrading to the 2020 body. Um, it's got a lot more material on it. It is a better body. I don't even think they make the 2019 body anymore. Because um, they had problems. Because they had problems. It so was a defect. you're looking at 150 bucks for the body and 150 bucks for us to do rebuild. Right. Uh, so the, the bodies are actually a little less than that, but yeah. So you're looking at 125 for a rebuild. You're looking at probably a hundred bucks for the body, and then uh, if, I would do both because if it happened to the one, it's going to happen to the other. And then uh, rear limit straps. That helps. Speaking of rear limit straps, if you're looking to buy anything from us, please visit <laughs> www.shocktherapyusa.com. Or if you have any questions, please call into the shop 623-217-4959. Thank you, Steve. 